Hi, everyone. Uh, just wanted to say thanks again for joining us today. This is the final installment of the Cargo Classroom Series, Working Smarter with PowerPoint. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to go through a couple of housekeeping items. First off, just wanted to say as a reminder that this session will be recorded and we'll be sharing this along with the homework assignments from today by tomorrow. If you have any questions, feel free to add them to the Q&A section, not in the chat. Um, if it's in the chat, it may get lost there, but I'll be monitoring it and so will jo uh, Joanna as well to make sure those all get answered. And then not only that, but if you joined us for the first two sessions, um, and now this is a third, that you are eligible to win those AirPod Pros or an iPad. So we'll be reaching out with the winners of that next week. And without further ado, I'm really excited to introduce for the third and unfortunately last time, Joanna. She is a PowerPoint expertise. Um, she is a certified presentation specialist and the founder of Presentitude. She's worked over 20 years in the communication industry and is actually a board member of the industry organization Presentation Guild, which is really focused in on promoting presentation design within the industry. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Joanna. Thanks, Amy. Welcome back, everyone. I am so excited to see you again for the third and last time here today. We are going to dive in and summarize everything we learned in the past two sessions, introducing some new concepts as well today. So today's topic is going to be design principles and how we can put those to use as we are creating slides. Now, um, first, a quick recap of session number two. You got a handout after last session and a couple of practices that you could work on at home. And I hope you did. If not, no worries. You have any time to work on that. But those really also summarize what we were working on last, uh, the last, during the last session. So in our session number two, we talked about different ways of creating visuals. So we started off by talking about animations. And animations, of course, takes place on the slide and you can have multiple animations uh, for different objects and animate your content uh, as you want. And the key to a good animating, animated slide begins in the selection pane. So we talked a lot about the selection pane. We also talked about morph transitions and morph transitions being that you create one slide and then you have an object on the slide or outside of the slide and then you create a second slide and you move those original objects over to the second slide and apply the morph transition making PowerPoint do the heavy lifting for you and animating those objects over to their new position. This, of course, as someone was mentioning last time, takes up more slides, but then slides are free. So this is a great way of having PowerPoint build animations for you. We also talked about Zoom and inserting Zoom links, meaning that we create a slide, a slide Zoom slide, and then we will insert links to other slides onto that um, that Zoom slide and we can tilt the content and tilt those links however we want and mold it into an animated slide as well, creating that additional visuals for our PowerPoint slides. There are other Zooms beyond the slide Zoom, but we focused on that one in our last session. We also talked about images cropping and uh, cropping to shape, like how do you create a circle? And we also talked about finally the merging shapes functionality that lives inside of PowerPoint where you can take two shapes or multiple shapes and um, uh, union them together, fragment, uh, subtract and create um, whatever shape you want and need when you are working with shapes in PowerPoint. And we also use that tool to take an icon and um, cookie cutter it uh, onto an image so we can create an image icon as well. So that is what we did last time in session number two. We will reuse some of these um, uh, tools we talked about last time in this session as we are bringing it all together. But before we dive into actually building a slide using all the things that we've learned, I want to take a moment just to talk about 
this concept of death by PowerPoint. Now, if you are working in PowerPoint every single day, or if you're working with presentations, you might have heard this, this concept that, uh, and there are you know, um, comedians that joke about it as well. It has become such a known concept that it even has its own Wikipedia entry. And this is the definition of death by PowerPoint. Criticism of slide-based presentations referring to a state of boredom and fatigue induced by information overload during presentations such as those created by the application PowerPoint. Now, let's take a moment here and be quite upset if you're a PowerPoint lover like me, because PowerPoint really didn't create the situation. It's not PowerPoint's fault that we have these slides that apparently are so boring that our audience will fall asleep. Uh, hopefully no one has died during a presentation, but I think that blaming PowerPoint for bad slide presentations or bad PowerPoints is like blaming your old typewriter for the bad poems you wrote. That is if you remember what a typewriter is, if you're old like me. But PowerPoint is really only a tool for you to use when you are creating something. And you need to know the tool. And if you know the tool and how to work it, you can create something that does not put your audience to sleep. I think that the concept of death by PowerPoint really starts with us being experts, specialists. And the more experience we have, the more the more fascinated we are by the complexity and, and nuance of what we know. And it is hard to let go of everything that we know. We wanna put everything on our slides. We wanna share every data point, every, um, every piece of expertise that we have gathered over the years. And it's hard to let go of what we know. We get cursed by our own knowledge. I think this is the start of death by PowerPoint, not PowerPoint in itself. We wanna put everything on our slides and we forget what it is to what it's like not to know what we already know. We forget to put ourselves in our audience shoes and remember that they don't know everything that we know and they might not need to either. And even if we know logically that reduced information on our sites is, is a good thing, we tend to we tend to forget to to remove it. And here's another thing that is true as well your audience will try to read everything you place on your slides, just like you did if you were looking at this slide as I put it on the slideshow. And if there's anything I want you to take away from these three sessions is this, everything you put on your slide will be put in the uh, attention span of your users, of your audiences. So be careful what you place on your slides. And the audience can read much faster than we can ever speak. And even, uh, we, even if we think we can, we cannot multitask. We cannot read, listen, uh, take notes at the same time, not even women. We cannot multitask. So we have to, as presenters, as PowerPoint creators, think about the slides that we are creating so that we help our audiences create something that doesn't put them to sleep. Beyond the curse of knowledge, I think that this is also at the essence of why we put our audiences to sleep with our, uh, with our PowerPoint decks. It is that we tend to forget to think about what type of PowerPoints we're actually creating. So one question that I always ask is, are you creating a presentation? Are you creating a presentation, meaning that you will be in front of an audience or in front of Zoom and it will be live. You are the presentation. You know the facts and figures, the data points, everything. The slides are really only there to support the facts and figures that you are presenting. There might be a Q&A session at the end or the audience might raise their hand and ask if something's unclear and you can clarify it. But everything that you talk about is your presentation. The slides really only support that. That is one type of presentation. Or are you actually only really preparing to create a document? A document meaning that it was never intended to be shown as part of a presentation. It might be distributed as a PDF. It's supposed to be read or printed by whoever gets this document in their hands. And you won't be around when they're actually opening up the presentation. So in reality, this document that you are creating needs to stand on its own. So suddenly maybe having incomplete sentences in bullets on your slide is not the way to go if you're creating a document. You might have to have full paragraphs. 
maybe starting at 32 points of a font size is a bad choice for this document because you need to explain what you're meaning on your slides. And presentations and documents are two different things. And that's by PowerPoint kind of begins when we are trying to do both at the same time. When we're trying to create a dual presentation, we're live in front of our audiences, we're actually presenting what is the document and uh, sort of our handout as well. We tried to address this a little bit in session number one when we talked about the different PowerPoint views. You know, when you went on the view tab and you have different views to show uh, your PowerPoint, uh, different, um, the different screens in, and we talked about what you can you do, what you can do with the notes page. And this is a way to create a three-in-one PowerPoint deck and to sort of try to avoid that overloading of information to your audiences. We have the slide itself that you edit in slide uh, edit mode. And then we have that notes page, which you can add to when you come to the view tab and to the notes page. And we'll get back to this as well today. And there, in, in this area, you can add more information and additional graphs and figures, what have you. And then you can also still keep those speaker notes that you can pull up in presenter view. So when you are presenting that slide that now has less information on it, you can still have some notes to remind you what you're supposed to cover when you talk about those topics or whoever you're creating the slide deck for. So this is one way of trying to reduce the information on slides so that you avoid killing your audiences and putting them to death by your PowerPoint slides. So we are going to um, uh, move over to talk about the design principles for non-designers that we can implement as we are creating slides. I'm pretty sure that none of you went to your high school counselor and said, when I grew up, I want to create PowerPoint slides. Or when I grew up, I want to um, spend my day in the software PowerPoint. You didn't. And even if you even went to design school, you probably didn't spend much time in PowerPoint either. So even if you have your design principles clear for you, this, this needs to be applied to this forum, to this uh, software, to this, uh, to this um, thing that we're creating, our slide decks. So what I'm trying to do here now in section number two is introduce you, if you're new to design at all, to some design principles that you can keep with you and use when you are designing your slides. And we will put them to use later when we actually do create a slide together. There's three design principles I wanna point out today. There are multiple others, but these are the three most important that I see could be uh, much more used by anyone who's designing slides, regardless of if you are a designer or not. And that is contrast, repetition, and alignment. So let's talk about contrast first. Contrast, it means that we wanna make our elements unique on our slides so that they stand apart. And we can do that by using, for example, color, size, and shape. And um, contrast really means difference. And it is one of the most, most powerful design concepts out there. Any, any object can be contrasted with one another. And the main purpose of using contrast when you're designing slides is that you want to try to make a point. You want to help your audience understand what they should be looking at and what the main focus is when you're, cry, when you're creating your slides. So for example, if you have a, a chart like this pie chart, you might know every single slice in this pie chart, but really when you think about it, the audience only need to know that first slice and what that stands for. So then contrast it, highlight it, and then uh, tone down the other parts of it so that they know, the audience know where they should focus and what they should look at. Same thing if you have a long sentence or a lot of text on your slides, highlight the most important part so that your eyes are drawn to that, that, that piece of your slide. And of course, the most important part of your slide can always be highlighted, such as the title on this particular sample title slide. The contrast is the first and most important um, uh, design principle that you can use, and we will put that to use a lot in a moment. The second design principle is repetition. Now, repetition means that we are going to reuse our elements so that they connect consistently and show them as part of a whole on our slides. So um, contrast, that meant showing difference. Repetition means that we are going to try to create a sense of um, unity, uh, consistency, co cohesiveness throughout our deck. Um, and 
one of the best ways of actually creating repetition is to really use the corporate template that you are working in. Templates should give you a framework to create repetitions throughout the deck. The position of the headline placeholder, the grid lines around your deck, the uh, font sizes, the color palette, the type of bullets there that is, has been set for the placeholders. So templates really create a good uh, repetition. So make sure that you keep true to the original template for your corporation. And also, if you are creating charts or have objects throughout your deck, make sure that you create them in the same style and maybe in the same position. Now, this doesn't mean that every slide should look the same, of course not, but you should try to find a way to keep consistent throughout your deck. If you're lucky enough, your company might have provided you with a set of icons, um, corporate icons that you can insert into your presentation. If not, make sure that you try to find the same type of icons, for example, or the same type of images, and make sure that the images are the same size and or the same shape, maybe only using circular images throughout or rectangular images or what have you. But try to find a way to create that repetition throughout your deck beyond using the template. The third and last design principle I want to address here today is alignment. Alignment meaning that we are going to connect our visual elements to create a cohesiveness and also sort of an invisible grid on our slides. Nothing on our slides should look like they were placed there completely randomly. Every, every element should connect visually in some way. Now, if repetition meant that we are going to um, unify elements across a deck, alignment means that we are going to try to find unity among the elements on a single slide. And alignment really is what makes a slide look professional and sophisticated. No one in your audience is going to sit there and think, oh, I see that they didn't align their objects here center or they didn't align them horizontally. They're not going to see that or notice that, but they are going to notice that things are slightly out of place and do not look as polished as it could. This is usually the first thing that I do when I get slide decks into my shop and I work with makeovers is to try to see how are things lining up? Are we using the template? Are we using a grid here? Are things aligned well together? And we talked about alignment tools last week and where we can find them on the home tab and the shape format tab and, and putting them to use. And alignment tools is something that you use constantly. It's not something you use once and then you're done. You probably will be moving things around as you create your slides and you might realign things again and back and up and down and forth. So alignment really is one of the tools that you should be using all the time. Hence my suggestion that you keep them on the quick access toolbar so that you always have them there ready to go when you need them. Okay, three design principles, contrast, repetition, and alignment. We will put those to use as we go into the more practical part of today when we are trying to create something uh, together, putting all everything uh, into practice here. Before we do, we're gonna talk about a couple of strategies for handling text intensive slides. So there are situations when you have a slide or you get a slide from a coworker and there's a lot of con uh, content on this slide and for whatever reason, you cannot remove any of the content. All the content has to stay. If you're in the financial industry, you know that there might be legal reasons for everything that everything on the slide needs to say exactly uh, what it said originally when it was um, approved by legal. You cannot remove even a single word because that might change the meaning. So you kind of stuck with these text intensive slides. So what can you do when you have them uh, in your hands and you wanna do something that works a little bit better for the audience and not put them to sleep? So let's say we have this slide. This is just some random made up content here. Benefits of using a planner, uh, three points, long sentences. What can we do thinking that we are not allowed to change anything on these slides in terms of the wording? Everything has to stay. So I'm gonna present five different strategies and quickly go through them here today. And in the handout, I will also link to one of my good friends, Nolan Hames. Uh, he is a presentation designer and he has provided 52 different strategies to handle text intensive bullet slides. And that is a great resource. If this is the type of slides that you get, in, you get in your hands all the time and give you some inspiration on what to do. But we're gonna focus on five here today. So the first thing that you can do when you have a slide like this, this traditional bulleted slide, a title, placeholder, and, and some bullets, is to highlight. Again, 
connecting back to our design principles, this means that we are going to provide some contrast. So if you have a lot of text, at least identify what is the most important thing on this slide and then highlight it. So it could be looking something like this, same amount of text, but immediately your eyes are drawn to the main points and, and suddenly it is a headline and three points and not a headline and three long sentences or a lot of content for the users. And also note that I have removed the bullets from this slide. And that is something that I just wanna say uh, it's not done enough. Uh, most corporate templates have bullets on in their placeholders. There is actually a technical reason for them being there because it's harder to bring them back than removing them out. But just because there are bullets in your placeholder doesn't mean that you absolutely have to use them. You can as well remove the bullets and increase the spacing between the paragraphs if need to. If you don't have a list that you're listing with bullets, remove the bullets. As long as you keep true to the template, making sure you're using the correct theme fonts and colors, you can remove the bullets. Be brave and don't keep the bullets in place. Bullets, by the way, also is a visual distraction because that is a visual object on your site that will take attention away from your audience. The second thing you can do when you have text intensive sites is to overemphasize. So you have a lot of text. Maybe you can even work with the fact that there is a lot of text. So for example, making um, dividers between the different pieces, adding some um, additional objects like these numbers here, again, adding some contrast, putting our alignment uh, to work here and repetition of, again, because we're using the same type of numbering here and the same type of lines. So overemphasizing can also be something you can do to that original bulleted slide on the left. The third part is something I think could be do much more often, and that is to split. Take those big, long sentences. If you cannot remove any of the text, well, you can split it up on different slides. Again, slides are free. You can use as many as you want and um, split the text up. Take one long sentence and put it on one slide each, and then put some contrast in there, add some highlight. You can get away with having a long full sentence on a slide, providing that it's just one sentence. And also, um, just like you have a long quote on a slide, you can get away with having some longer text on the slide. So splitting your content up on multiple slides can def definitely be a good strategy for those text intensive slides. The fourth one is to chunk. This is my favorite strategy quickly uh, to take your content and just chunk it up in different pieces and placing them vertically or horizontally on your slide. Some organizations have great corporate templates that provide slide layouts that make it easy to chunk the information, even if it's a lot of content that you need to keep on your site for maybe legal reasons. Sometimes there's not, and you might have to create it yourself, and uh, that's okay. You just have to find a way to use your format shape and your uh, other tools that we've talked about to create something like this maybe, where we chunk up, we take our three sentences, we add our highlight in this case in like a, a subtitle, and we frame it all together same amount of text, much more accessible for the user than the slide to the left. And then finally, um, the final uh, strategy is Tablify. Now, I don't know if Tablify is a word, I made it up, but I think that tables sometimes can be used for uh, these text heavy slides. So add a table, remove all the shading and outlines and put your text inside of these tables. And now it is pretty easy to move the text around and, and, and change the width or height of your rows and columns. And you can, again, add some, uh, some uh, contrast to these slides as well. But tables are really good at putting a lot of content on a slide. This, this particular table is using only the inside borders and none of the outside borders. So it's a quick, easy way of um, handling a lot of text on slides. Okay, so um, in the end though, if you don't have legal reasons for your slides to be over at least text intensive, this is what you gotta do. You just got to remove your content. If you can be allowed to, 
then remove content. If you want to avoid killing your audiences by your boring PowerPoints, you got to remove content. There's just no way around it. And it's again, we are cursed by our knowledge. It's really hard. We want it all on our sides. But if you want to be successful in creating those sides, you have to be brave and remove your content. So this is also one of the other things that um, is a big takeaway. Your audience will read everything on your slides and you got to remove content. Okay, so we're going to put this to uh, action. We're going to take this slide. Before you start reading it, I'm going to help you out by highlighting what I think is most important here so you can follow along as we take this slide and create this into something that is more accessible to the users. So this slide is about the role of aesthetics and visual fluency in relation to consumer choice. That's a long headline there, but it all has to do, this slide has to do with aesthetics and visual fluency. Then there's four paragraphs, four uh, pieces to this slide. The first one talks about the fact that consumers decide within 90 second, seconds if they like a product or not. So 90 seconds is the key there for that first paragraph. The second uh, paragraph gives us two quotes. They're good quotes, not necessarily connected to the other bullets, but I like the quote. I'm going to see if we can reuse it. So I've highlighted one of the quotes to keep. And then the third paragraph talks about that visually fluent products, they draw upon the consumer's pre-existing associations. Okay, so that is another important part of this slide, the pre-existing associations. And then the fourth paragraph talk about color, composition and imagery typography as visual cues that we can uh, that is associated with this phenomena of fluency. So I am going to be brave and I'm going to remove everything from my slides. And this is what we're going to work with when we create this slide. So what, would, what can we do? What is the first step after we've removed all the content from our slides? Well, I usually say that start with your template. And I said this in session number one when we talked about slide layouts. Um, that a good first step is to check what slide layouts you have in your template that is provided to you by your company or the template you're currently working with. I think that most PowerPointers are sometimes a little bit lazy. They tend to just use the title only or maybe the title and content uh, slide layout instead of exploring what's actually in a specific template. Now, again, slide layouts are those layouts that are available in every single PowerPoint file. If you go to the home tab and new slide and expand that window, you'll see what is available inside of your template. So here we have uh, this particular template and we have a couple of candidates here that we might use to start with. And I also mentioned in session number one that you can also always hack a slide layout. If there's something that doesn't fit you, you can always um, try to mold it into what you need. So we're gonna see here, we're gonna test out and check out these three particular slide layouts here and see what we can do. So we're gonna start out with checking out the content with caption and then the statement and the site title and see if that could work for us. So, here we have the content with caption slide layout. So this is a good one. It has a title placeholder. It has that caption box to the right, sorry, to the left there for that quote maybe. And it has a content placeholder um, that we could sort of work with. So this could be as a good starting point to see if we can do something with this. Um, let's check out the other one there, the statement one. So this is the statement one. So this one has a title placeholder, a content placeholder to the left. And it has this big yellow box here, which is a good place for that quote. So hmm, this is interesting. Maybe I'll use this one, but I'm also gonna test out and see what else is provided to me in my current template. Here we have the side content. Now this is an interesting one because as you might see, this doesn't have that traditional uh, headline placeholder that is at the top uh, left corner across the side, but the headline placeholder is actually this whole area to the left. And I like that. I think that that is a way to break up content just because, again, there are bullets. You don't have to use bullets. And just because there's a title placeholder in the same position doesn't mean that you can do something differently and do something like this. And mm, this could work. Maybe we'll you know, work with this. It doesn't give me a place to put that, uh, that particular quote that I want to use. And maybe for this, uh, this type of slide, I actually do need a headline placeholder. So let's go back and see what we can do. I actually think that we are, in this case, going to try out and create something from scratch. We are going to use the title only slide layout and create something from this here. So we are going to go out, out of slide, um, 
uh, slide show mode and we're going to build this together and see what we can come up with. So we have, um, we have uh, four areas here, one, two, three, four. And I think that I'm going to start with the quote because I want that quote to be sort of standing out and onto the side. So the first thing I'm going to do is, well, I'm going to make it into a quote. I'm going to capitalize the P. Oops, I'm not going to print, sorry. Uh, I'm going to capitalize the P. And um, then I'm going to, I think I'm going to put it to the right hand side and I'm going to fill it. So I'm going to go to my home tab and then I'm going to uh, fill it with this uh, color here, the dark blue color. And then I'm going to change the text color to white. And um, that's what I'm going to work with. And again, I'm working on a PC, but all of these features are available on the Mac. It looks almost the same. And if it's not, I'm going to point that out to you. But as far as we are now, it looks the same and it's same tabs and same functionality. Now, what I want to do, I want to bring it up here to the corner of my slide. So I'm going to push it up to the corner and you can see what is going on here. Why can't I resize this? This is a common challenge. As you can see, no matter what I try to do, it just resizes it back again. So let's see what's going on. We're going to open up the shape, uh, the format shape functionality. If you're in a PC, you can keep that one on your quick access toolbar to quickly get to it. If you're not on a PC or if you're in a PC but didn't customize your quick access toolbar or if you're on a Mac, when you are on your, when you select that shape, right click or command click and at the very bottom, almost at the very bottom, you'll find the format shape. So we're going to click to expand that one, and that's going to open up our format shape here out to our very right. Now I'm going to, on the format shape tab, go to my size and properties out here to the very right and expand that one. And I'm going to expand my text box settings so I can see what's going on here. And as you can see, we have three options for how this text box can uh, behave. We have resize shape to fit text, string text on overflow, and do not out of it. And this text box is currently set to si resize shape to fit text. That means that no matter what I try to do, PowerPoint will try to help us by moving this text box back to fit the text in here. And I don't want that to happen because I want this quote to be all across the slide. So I'm going to change the setting to do not out of it, like so. Now I'm going to put it into the corner up here. So I'm going to use my alignment tools. And again, I find my alignment tools on the shape format tab. So shape format. And here we have the alignments. So I'm going to expand the alignments and I'm going to align this box to the right first. That was to the right. And then I'm going to align it again to the top. Now it's at the top, I don't have to eyeball it. I just can use my alignment tools. And now I can resize this one and bring it down. Maybe I'll put it something like this, like so almost. Um, and um, here we go. We have our box here. I think actually I'm going to make the text bold. So I'm going to go over to my home tab where I can control my font. So I'm going to make it bold. And I think I'm going to make it a little bit larger. I'm going to make it 32. And as you can see, there is a slight, it's very tight with the padding in this text box. So I'm going to go back to my format shape and click again on my size and properties, the third one out here to the very right. And in my text box settings, I'm going to increase my padding to 0.2 for all size. That works a little bit better. Maybe we'll even push it out a little bit more like so. And I'm going to make sure that I have my text alignment to be middle. That's good. I'm good to go. I'm good. I'm happy with this. I'm going to leave it as is. I'm going to go back to my other pieces of the puzzles here. So we have the 90 seconds part and we have the pre-existing associations and the different visual cues. Maybe 90 seconds only is a little bit too little here. So I am going to, I've actually prepared this like a good chef. I have prepared a sentence so I don't have to type it in to save us some time. I'm going to add some information to this sentence here. So here we go. I'm going to add this here. So we have a little bit more text here. So make it into a sentence. Consumers decide if they like a product within 90 seconds. Same thing with pre-existing associations. I think I want a little bit more text. So I'm going to add some text here to this sentence. I'm going to paste it in and then I'm going to see what it looks like here. So we have visually fluent products draw upon consumers pre-existing associations. Okay, good. 
And then the last part uh, here to the puzzle, the visual cues, I think that these are great candidates to be a little bit more of a visual um, components on my slide. So I'm actually going to remove this and replace this text with visuals. And I'm just going to add a text box up here uh, that uh, gives me the introduction to those visuals that I'm going to add. But first, we are going to fix our boxes. So I'm going to select all of my boxes, making sure I have my format shape tab open. And on my format shape tab, I'm going to go out to the size and properties out here to the very right again. Now I'm going to make sure that I have this set to do not out of fit again so I can make them the same size so that PowerPoint doesn't resize them to fit the text. So I'm going to make sure that they are set to do not out of it. Then I'm going to make sure that my vertical alignment is set to middle. And then I'm going to remove the padding. I'm going to take it down to zero so that I can uh, line these up nicely on my slide. And then I'm going to expand my size part here on the format shape tab, size and properties and size. And I'm going to make them the same height. So I'm just going to click on the up arrow until I'm happy. I think this is good. They're all the same height now out here. So that's good. And now I'm going to make them also the same width. So I'm going to click through until I think I'm in a good position. I think that a little bit longer, maybe something like this, I think. And then I'm going to, as I have my object selected, I'm going to push the first one up to the upper corner there. So I have it lined up with my template alignment again, making sure that that is aligned to those guidelines that I have made sure that I can see. And then I'm going to make sure that everything is lined up to the first one. I'm going to click on my text boxes. I'm going to go to shape format, align, align to the left. I'm going to bring this up a little bit more. And now I want to make sure that there's equally space between these. So I am going to click and select all three, go back to my shape format and then I'm going to go to my alignment tools and I'm going to use the distribute vertically so that PowerPoint is spacing out these text boxes for me so I don't have to think or try to put them on the side I'm going to let PowerPoint do the work for me so I'm going to distribute them vertically they were pretty aligned already but just to make sure okay so now we have our three components here I'm actually going to apply some contrast to the most important part here to help our viewers so maybe something like this and then I'm going to bring in my visuals. I've already prepared those to save us some time. I have some icons and some text, and these are all already sized up using the format shape. So I'm going to bring it in. So this is oh, this is starting to look okay. I think that with the icons and the text, I might want to add some additional uh, framing to these to make sure that they are there's a good proximity between the icons and the text, and users can see that they belong together. So I'm actually going to bring in some shapes here that again I've already prepared so I'm going to bring in the shapes up to frame it I'm going to make sure when I have all the frames selected I'm going to go to my shape format tab and send this back to the back so that they are always in the back and I like this idea of having this white box with a shadow and I want the same treatment for all of these shapes so I'm going to paint this format to my other shapes here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to click and select my white rectangle with the, shadow, with the shadow. And as this one is selected, I'm going to go up to my home tab. And here in the home tab, all the way to the very uh, left, we have the format painter, same position for the Mac. I'm going to double click on it so that it's selected. As you can see, now it's sort of a darker color here. That means that I have now a format painter if you can see my little cursor here it has a little tiny arrow and a little paintbrush so i'm going to make sure that i click on that um shape there and then i'm going to click again and again and now i just format painted the formatting of that first text box to the other ones there and then i can click anywhere where i don't have anything to unactivate the format painter okay so this looks this looks okay. Uh, it's still a lot of stuff going on on this slide. So maybe I want to control it and let's apply some animation to this slide. I think that I want my first uh, three pieces here. This one should come in first. So I'm going to select it. Uh, and then I'm going to go to my animations tab. 
and I'm going to click on my fade here to bring that one in. And again, this is, I mentioned this last time, this is where the Mac looks a little bit different. So on the Mac, oops, went too far. Uh, let's go down. So let's go up so we can see it. So on the Mac, when you go to animations, you have to scroll in this area to find the fade. And it looks a little bit different on the Mac, but you can find fade that I just used. So this, and, or any other animation that you prefer, I prefer fade. So I'm going to click that first pair first um, text box there then i'm going to click on my second and that's going to be fade as well and then i'm going to click on my third that's going to be fade and then i want each of these to come in one at a time i could group them together if i wanted to or just grab them all together so i'm grabbing them selecting them all and then i'm going to uh, have them maybe i'll have them float in and then i'm going to grab my second group all together and then float in grab my fourth to float in and then my sorry my third and this is the fourth to float in here and um then we have my quote i think i want my quote to come in as the very last part of this animation to sort of bring me to my next slide of this presentation so and i want this quote to come in from the side so i'm going to click on the text box and then i am going to go to my animations tab and then i'm going to go and find a motion path so i'm going to click on the motion path so i have to expand my animations here click on the motion path and then i have to select the effects options i want to go from the left to the from the from the right to the left so i'm going to click left here if you are on a mac this also this looks a little bit this is the one tab where it looks a little bit different so when you are on your animations tab on the mac you will click on the path animation here and then this is what comes up and you will just choose that line uh, there and then you change you change the effect options as well so it works the same it just looks a little bit different when you are on the mac okay so i want my animation to come in this uh, this quote to come in from the outside from the from the right i'm going to move out a little bit so we can see how we can do this so i'm going to put this outside of my slide and then I want it to come in and line up with the slide. So as I have this selected, um, I am going to click on this little arrow here. And let's zoom in so we can see what's going on a little bit, a little bit out so we can see. So as you can see, I can see my motion path that PowerPoint gave me as I clicked on that animation. If I click on this tiny little arrow uh, um, out there, the triangle, you can see I now have a dot and I can see sort of a preview of where my animation will add, uh, end up. And holding down my shift key so that I'm moving it in a um, straight angle, I'm gonna move it in so that it lines up with my slide here. This is a little bit tricky because you, um, you only get this preview and you can't use your, your arrow. So it's good enough maybe. Um, and there we go. Let me see if I can bring it a little bit closer to that edge there. Oh, we're going to put it like that. Okay, so now I'm going to open my animation pane on my animations tab, animation pane, and here I can see all of my animations. And I had already renamed my objects in the selection pane so that my animations are easy to check if something goes wrong. So let's open the selection pane quickly here. So we're going to go to home tab, range, selection pane. Or when something is selected, we can go to our shaped format tab, shape format tab and the selection pane. And here we can see all my different objects that I renamed so that when I am on the animation pane, I can see exactly what's going on. So let's put this in slideshow mode. So here we have animation number one, number two, and then number three. And then I can bring these in one by one as I want to. And then finally, my quote is gonna come in from the side to the exact position where I had it. So this is how you can take that original bullet slide and turn it into something completely different by breaking it up. And the first thing you do is remove content because it's when you remove content that you can start rebuilding the slide so that it looks better and works better for your audience. And then you can add, for example, animations. You could also do this by doing morph or zoom if needed to be. I also uh, have the handout ready to go with additional information for my audience. So we can take a look at that. If we go back to my slide here, 
and we uh, go back to the view tab. We're going to open up the view tab on our PowerPoint ribbon up here, and we're going to click on the notes page in the presentation view. This is the notes page for this particular slide. And what I did is that this is the preview on my slide, that the little thumbnail that always comes on the notes page. And as you can see, we don't see the quote here. And the reason for that is, of course, it's animated. So it's outside of the slide, so we won't see it. So I don't really need this thumbnail, I decided. I am just going to reuse some of the uh, objects that I created. So instead of having the thumbnail out there, I am just going to um, bring in, I just copied and pasted these objects from my slide. I put a text box here uh, as my quote. This is another text box. And I made that long title come back because it makes sense if it's a, if it's a document that the user will read. And then I can share this, this page here as part of uh, my handout when I go back to my um, when I um, when I'm done with my presentation. So this is the view tab notes page. Now I'm going to go back to normal again. And um, uh, we saw our animations here quickly go through them so we can get to this overview, the original slide and the animated slide and the handout notes page. Now, what if we wanted to do something more fancy? Maybe we wanted to do uh, some morphs or we wanted to do some zoom things. So I made a version with that as well. So this is what I, this is an option. Maybe you want to do something that is even more visual. Maybe you can get away with not having that slide title uh, up in the upper left corner. So um, we have our main points here to the left. And then we have this, uh, this icon that I broke apart um, using uh, my merge tools and my tools in PowerPoint. And then as I talk through these main points, we can talk about the visual cues for fluency. And this is a slide zoom tab. Uh, the shapes came in using morph, and then we have slide zooms. So we can talk about the visual cues for fluency. And here we have the first part, compositions and facts and figures, colors, and then we have imagery, and then we have typography, and then we come back to the original slide. So again, how did we build this? Let's zoom out so we can take a look. We have this slide. This is the slide where everything happens. So the slide before that is where we have our shapes. So these are the different pieces of that icon on the slide before. So they are on slide 31 out here. Here we have them on slide 31. And then between slide 31 to 32, if we take a look at the transitions, this is slide 32. There's a morph transition applied. So that PowerPoint will bring them all back in together here. And then these are Zoom. So if I click on this and highlight it, we can see that the Zoom uh, tool opens up. So here we have the Zoom. And these are slides here. And here have, we have my slides. This is actually slide 33. And this is slide 34. Oops. And this is, and so on and so forth. And as you can see, these have red backgrounds. They have a shape that I added to the background so that I can have white text and still see what I was typing. And I wanted the text to be centered because I wanted it to fit into my little skull shapes here. So I just created the slide with everything in, in the center. And then when I brought the zooms in, uh, into my slide. So let's say we're going to rebuild this here. So we're going to take our visual cues. So we are going to go to my insert tab and then to the zoom. And again, we are doing a slide zoom. So we want to insert a link to that uh, particular slide onto the slide zoom. So I'm going to click on the slide zoom function here and I'm going to find that slide. So it's this one, slide 33. I'm going to insert it. And as you can see, it's red. So as I have this selected, the slide zoom, the zoom tab opens up and I'm going to remove the zoom background here. Uh, on my tab, I'm going to remove it. And now I only have the text and then I can reposition it back in onto the slide. So that is how you can make something even more complex if you wanted to using the tools that we have talked about in these three sessions. So we have talked about um, design tools in the first session we talked about different side design tools where to find them and how to use them and the quick access toolbar in the second session we talked about creating visuals different ways of doing that the merge shapes the using images and animations and and zoom tools and morph transitions and today we talked about 
the design principles and avoiding that death by PowerPoint, what to do when we have text intensive sites, and the most important thing when creating sites, removing content as much as you can so you can rebuild it for your audiences. So before we go to Q&A, I just wanted to share some resources uh, here. I, this is part of your handout as well, so you don't need to freak out with all the links here. It's part of your handout. Uh, I mentioned the 52 design alternatives to bullet points. That is my friend Nolan Hames who created this. It's a great resource. There's a presentation podcast that I highly recommend talking about PowerPoint and design and presentation design. If you are finding issues with your PowerPoint template and it's not professionally built and you want to try to fix it, the Building PowerPoint Templates is the only book and the best book out there uh, about PowerPoint templates and why and how you build them. Uh, I'm a board member of the Presentation Guild, the industry organization for PowerPointers and presentation designers. Have great resources. It has a Slack forum where you can connect with the PowerPoint MVPs and ask any type of PowerPoint question and some information about how to reach me as well there. And with that, I want to go to Q&A and see do we have any questions or comments thus far here. Okay, I just see the one question in the chat um, about hiding um, all those other slides except for slide 32. Yeah, so we can we can see what happens here. We're going to hide our slides so they're not part of the presentation. And then if we now go into slideshow mode and see they're going to show up, but they're going to be gone. So they you can't. Um, you can't hide them, they have to be visual. So using Zoom is probably something that you would do um, if you don't share your deck. Because of course, if we go out, we take this out into slide sorter mode, this maybe doesn't make as much sense. This is more of a presentation deck. And this is probably something that I would create that I'm presenting, not necessarily something that I would share later. Um, what I would share would probably be the handout uh, maybe, but if you wanted to create something that is more fun to watch or builds uh, more of a fluent visual presentation, um, you can do that. But yeah, you can't uh, uh, you can't hide them. If that was the question, if you can hide the slides, hiding slides. By the way, if you if you right click on a slide, you can hide it. And if you hide a slide when you're in slideshow mode, that slide is not going to show up. It's just you're going to jump over it from one slide to the other. So if you have slides that you're unsure, maybe you're going to keep them in there, but you don't want it to show in your actual presentation, you can right click and hide it. You can see it just became a little blurry here and you can see that little um, cross out. You can also see that in slice order mode that this one here is hidden. So that is a technique that you can use if you have a lot of slides and some of them you don't want to show. But for slice zoom, they have to be visible. Awesome. Um, I know we have a couple minutes left. Um, are there any other questions? If so, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, but the only other question I see right now is about sending a link and just wanted to confirm that we will be sending through this presentation so you can rewatch it or send it over to anyone on your team that wasn't able to join today. Yep, so, and everything we talked about today is also summarized on the handout. So design principles and, and, and all of that is also gonna be part of the handout as well. So everything will be there packed up for you tomorrow. Awesome, well, I think, um, Joanna, I think that wraps it up for this PowerPoint series. Thank you for walking us through all of these hot tips throughout the past three weeks. And um, also thank you everyone else for taking the time to join in on the PowerPoint fun. And um, hopefully we'll see you guys soon here as we continue this cargo classroom throughout the rest of the year. Thank you.